Welcome, everybody, to my favorite webinar to lead. Actually, I prefer it to be more like a workshop and more interactive, not just me lecturing. So um, we'll try to make this as interactive as we can. I'm Liz Stebley. I'm one of the three independent consultants who started PICA. Oh, I don't know when we first started working on it, maybe seven years ago. And uh, well, that one more person's coming into the, into the meeting. Great. Uh, and uh, so, as I was saying, I was one of the three independent consultants who started PICA about seven years ago. And uh, let me introduce myself real briefly, and that'll explain how and why PICA was born. So uh, I've been a consultant since the last century. I started uh, as an internal consultant with a Fortune 500 company, and then I went into external consulting with one of the big four at the time, big four global firms. Once my daughter was born, that big firm model was no longer going to work for me because, uh, you know, that's the lifestyle decision if you work for a big firm. And so I literally fell into independent consulting in 2004 um, when I had gotten laid off from another internal job. And so that year I worked fewer hours, made more money, uh, lowered my effective tax rate, didn't have to deal with the big firm yet. And more importantly, I had more quality time with my kid. So that first year I looked back and I said, this is great. Everybody should be doing this. But of course, it's not quite that simple. Uh, so I was a very successful independent consultant for about five years. I used to do organizational change strategy and implementations for big hairy tech projects worldwide. And um, I started my first company in 2009 when I discovered there was a need in the market for uh, to deal with compliance and contract administration. So my other company, which is actually how I make my living, Pika is my volunteer side hustle. But my other company is a, a national agency that represents independent consultants who specialize in org effectiveness, and we handle their contracts with Fortune 500 companies. As a result of growing Proco into a multi-million dollar business, I got the person to, uh, reputation as the person to call if and when you have questions about being self-employed. So I started getting asked out to coffee like twice a week, and people were asking me the same questions. And finally, I realized people have a lot of questions and need help, and there's got to be a better way to help more people than to drink a lot of coffee. So I reached out to two fellow independent consultants, and I said, hey, I've got this idea for this educational organization and community where people can get their questions answered, get the help they need. Um, nothing like this exists, didn't then, but now it does because it's created Pika. And uh, my two colleagues said, yeah, we should do it. So that's a little bit why we why we created Pika, because it was all about me wanting to drink less coffee. Now, it's um, in a nutshell, it's an educational organization and community. It's super informal. In fact, I run these uh, webinars and workshops solo. Uh, there's only two people that run Pika part-time. It's me and Marissa is the wizard behind the curtain. Um, and um, anyway, that's enough about me. You didn't come here to learn about me. Normally when we do PICA workshops, as opposed to public webinars, we do introductions so that you can expand your network and get to know each other a little better. But um, today we are not going to do that. Okay. Uh, I'm actually gonna put a message in the chat before I forget. There is a worksheet that goes with this uh, with this webinar that I encourage you to download and take notes on, whether you do it now or later. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go through, I think there's 10 or 12 things to consider, whether or not uh, solopreneurship or being self-employed is the right path for you. Uh, I'm actually going to try to talk you out of it in the first 45 minutes of this webinar. And the reason is because being self-employed is the hardest job you will ever have. Sounds all glamorous. You can choose your own hours. You don't have to deal with, the, you know, with the boss or commuting or whatever. But it is hard because you have to push your boundaries. You have to do things you're not familiar with. You have to learn things you've never done before, like how to write a contract, how do I negotiate my rates. Um, so yes, it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> so I will literally try to talk you out of it in the next forty in the next forty five minutes. If I haven't talked you out of it by then, there's a section on how to get started. How you can test the waters. Uh, without fully committing and what i mean by fully committing is like building your website setting up your llc and all of that sort of stuff so we'll talk a little bit about subcontracting and how to do that uh and then uh, there's one slide at the end for like if you're really sure you want to do this what the next steps would be so as this slide says you're on mute but you don't have to be please make this as interactive as possible uh, because it's more fun for everybody 
uh, it's easier for me if you just take yourself off mute and interrupt me or raise your virtual hand or something. I mean, I have all your little squares at the top of my screen, but still, sometimes it's hard to see with all this stuff going on. But let's try to make it interactive. It's hard for me to toggle over and find the chat. So uh, speaking up is better. Okay. Oh, yes, and of course, you'll get the slides, you get a link to the recording, you get everything by end of day tomorrow. So you don't have to be taking surreptitious screenshots <laughs> with your iPhone as we go along. I'm guilty of that. I've done it before. <laughs> All right. So let's get into this today. All right. So as I said, uh, being self-employed is the hardest job you will ever have. And uh, part of the reasons is, as I mentioned, you have to learn new things and push your, push your boundaries. But uh, really, it's uh, all about mastering the FUD monster. I call it the FUD monster because I have this little image in my head of this, you know, little monster chewing away at my confidence saying, you know, you don't know how to do, you don't know how to do sales. You don't know how to do this. What do you, you know, who do you think you are? You know, it's like whole imposter syndrome thing coming up. So it'd be helpful for me if I uh, had a, a sense of what your a, a bigger FUDs are. And maybe I can go a little deeper when we get into that in that area of the uh, workshop or webinar. So you can either uh, put them in the chat because at the moment I do have the chat window open or just come off mute and let me know what is maybe your top fear and certainty or doubt about being self-employed. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and, and chime in if that's okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Valerie. And uh, I think the biggest uncertainty is like, you know, it's, it's, I think if you knew you were guaranteed success and you would have a, just a, you know, gangbuster business, it would be a lot easier to say, great, I'm going to give this a shot. Um, but that fear of the unknown is different than the fear of the unknown of maybe having been laid off a couple of times and maybe thinking, you know, right, is this a better avenue for me to at least try? And so there's there's a lot of stuff that kind of weaves its way through. Yes, I totally agree with you, Valerie. And uh, Paula wrote in the chat, how will I find clients? That's a huge uncertainty. Uh, we will talk about that a little bit uh, today, for sure, because I think that is probably the biggest, <laughs> the biggest fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And, and again, George reiterated that, finding clients and opportunities, uh, maintaining a pipeline of work, which is, Along with that same thing, it was like, where, how do I get the business? How do I get the work? How do I find the clients? How do I get a pipeline? Uh, and we'll talk about that a, a little bit. We definitely will talk a little bit about health insurance too. Craig, when I get to the slide that talks about benefits, um, uh, we can go into that a little bit deeper if you have any specific questions too. And Sonia says similar for me, so I'm gonna assume that's all of the above. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd like to chime in as well. Mm -hmm. Jane. Um, so for me, it's a lot about how do I articulate my value um, and how do I negotiate my value when I am you know, trying to negotiate a contract uh, with somebody? Yes, it's um, the, <laughs> confidence is everything when you're self-employed and quoting rights. There is um, there's there's two there's two prongs to your uh, to your foot, Jane. One is articulating your value, and that's really about defining your niche and knowing what you, what you're really good at, what you knock it out, you know, when you really knock it out of part, and more importantly, what how that matches up with client client needs when they might need to hire somebody like you. And we have a whole workshop that really digs into that. Um, mm. uh, so it's counterintuitive. A lot of people think when they step into being self-employed that they should go to market as a jack of all trades, but the reverse is true. Uh, if you put yourself in your client's shoes, they actually want to hire an expert. They don't want to hire a jack of all trades. So, uh, so yes, that's a very, a very important piece. Uh, thankfully, there's a lot of tools, workshops, workshops, and other opportunities to work on that sort of thing for Pika. Uh, the other is negotiating, negotiating your value. Yes, we have a billing rates of pricing strategies workshop. I think I just led it last week. And we're thinking of splitting it to two workshops, actually, because it's such a complicated uh, topic, right? There's like, okay, how do I figure out my rate when I'm just getting started? And then there's 
how do I do value pricing? How do I do fixed fee pricing? How do I price by the project? By the project, when is that appropriate? Uh, is a hybrid rate more more practical? Uh, and I'm a huge fan of fixed pricing and hybrid pricing, but we won't have time to get into that today. But yes, there are resources yeah. definitely to help with that. That's great. Thank you. Okay, cool. All right. Well, thank you for sharing. And uh, it's one thing I will say about Bud is that I've been to, I'm, I'm on, uh, actually it's this month, I'm celebrating my 20th anniversary of being self-employed. And uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, it never goes away. The Bud Monster keeps creeping back. For me, it's very predictable that the Bud Monster uh, rears its head in December because a lot of client contracts in my other business end at the end of the year. And I always think our business is going down the toilet. It's going to fall off a cliff. We're not going to be able to pay, pay ourselves in January. And it's never the case. But I still, in, in December, I'm always, I'm always anxious because I always have this this gnawing fear in my head that we're not going to get any new business. So it never fully goes away. The trick is learning how to recognize it and say, okay, thank you. I really just trying to protect me and then go away. <laughs> Sometimes I have people come into my weekly office hours, not because they have a question, just, but just because they're like, okay, I've just got an unusual amount of fun this week and I don't know what to do. <laughs> and we talk. All right, so let's get into the uh, top 10 things to consider or me trying to talk you out of it. Uh, so basically there's two, there's two sides to the money management thing, obviously here. A slow and erotic cash flow is probably the hardest part about being self-employed, especially if you plan to work with large companies. The larger the company, the longer it takes to pay or to get paid. Uh, it's, Again, counterintuitive, but that's just the way it rolls. So my other company does uh, work with Fortune 500 companies. Uh, they're almost all at uh, 60 days. Some of them are going to have contracts say 90 days. I had one come and it's a the payment terms were 120 days, and I said no, we can't accept that. <laughs> all of our people are self-employed. You know, we have to pay our bills, and, and we negotiate the standard at least 30 days. Most of the time we do get um, a concession to 45, but um, yes, it's, it's, even if you, if you have a client starting, you know, March 1st and you, you do work for them and you bill for it on March 31st or August or April 1, you're not going to see any, any money for at least another two months in all likelihood. Uh, so you must have a bridge or, or a, a safety net, right? Um, because it, it take you have to do the work and then build for the work and then there's this whole this whole waiting time. Uh, I also want to point out though that the cash flow is erratic. That depends on the type of work you do. Now, once you're let's say you're an executive coach and once you're established and you have a, a you know a stable of ten paying clients or whatever, it does tend to be more predictable. But if you're planning to do project based work like independent consulting, uh, it's it's super erratic. <laughs> so. Let's see, I was actually doing consulting work for, I forget, 12 years or something. And my monthly income ranged from $5,000 a month to $24,000 a month. Now, clearly $24,000 a month is a good living. But you can't live as a single mom in San Francisco on 5K a month. So you have got to have some uh, a safety net or some sort of pool of money that you, that you can draw from. My favorite trick, actually, well, Two things about this. When I fell into independent consulting, I had been laid off. So I had some severance pay. So some of you might be in that boat, which is that makes it for a pretty safe time to make the leap. Because uh, when I fell into independent consulting, uh, I got the notice that I was going to be laid off. That same day, I called a former client down in Silicon Valley and I said, Hey, I just got laid off. Do you guys need any help down there? And he said, Are you kidding? How soon can you get here? So literally, I had my first client the following week. I didn't even have a laptop yet. Uh, so and my severance was, I forget what it was at the time, three or four months, whatever. So I, for a little while, I was double dipping. But my other favorite trick that I did successfully for years and years and years was I would hide money for myself. So every time a client paid me, I would take 
40 to 50 percent. I started at 50 percent, and as I got more confident, it was cut back to 40 percent. I took half of every payment and I put it into a different bank. Not my normal bank, because if I logged in, I was with Wells Fargo at the time. If I logged in and saw that I had eight thousand dollars in savings, I'd tell my daughter, "Hey, yeah, I'm going to go on vacation." Knowing that it's for for uh, quarterly taxes, but it doesn't matter. I have no fiscal discipline, so I literally put it in a different bank. Then when it was time to pay quarterly taxes, I would transfer from secret bank to normal bank and pay my quarterly taxes. And lo and behold, when it came to do my annual tax return, I would have anywhere from twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars left over. And that money went into my self-employed retirement account, except IRA, should have been a 401k, solo 401k. That lowered my effective tax rate. So I was paying myself, saving for my future, lowering my effective tax rate. And that's where the magic is to creating and building wealth uh, when you're self-employed. But you have that. You have to be able to either be fiscally responsible or do what I did and hide the money from yourself. <laughs> But that's how you, uh, to speak to the other half of the slide here on the taxes slide, the first time I was, the first year I was self-employed, you know, yeah, I conceptually knew about quarterly taxes, but then when my first payment was due and it was like $12,000, I was like, holy smokes, I don't have $12,000, and I was caught short. Uh, I think I had to borrow money from my brother or something to make that first payment, but you uh, don't want to be in that position, so you either need to squirrel money away like I did or have that safety net. Uh, but you also need to be organized enough to keep track of like your bookkeeping, how much do you owe? And thankfully like TurboTax can estimate these things for you. Or if you use something like a uh, QuickBooks self-employed, it'll, it'll estimate it for you too. So, but anyway, dealing, dealing with erratic cash flow and quarterly taxes and the type of accounting financial things it, you have to evaluate if you have the stomach for that type of stuff. All right. Next thing to consider. Uh, do you have, uh, can you deal with uncertainty? So yes, it is a little bit like being on a trapeze and not knowing if that guy is going to catch you. Uh, and there's the best way I can even explain this. We, are, we talked about the flood monster, okay? Everybody has this, this fear, uncertainty, and doubt that you're not going to get enough projects. But uh, let me just tell a quick story because this is the easiest way to sum it up. So when I fell into independent consulting, it was in 2004. And I had a friend of mine who had worked at Accenture, and she was laid off in the same company that I was laid off in 2004. And she went to work as an internal consultant with a Fortune 500 company. And I said to her, Benita, you know, this is awesome, right? You, you can, you don't have to work 40 hours a week. You can work as much or as little as you want. You have more flexibility. And, and so, so for the first couple of years, I kept saying you should go and become independent, become independent. And then she went to work. She went back to work for Accenture and she was traveling on the road. And I said, Benita, you're crazy. I'm telling you, this is the way to go. And finally she said, Liz, I appreciate your enthusiasm trying to, you know, you're trying to co coach me into this. She says, but I've given it thought and I will freak out. Literally, I won't be able to sleep at night if I don't have a steady paycheck. Because she was a single woman. She had her, you know, she had her condo, her mortgage payment on her condo. She says, I, I need the security of knowing I can make that mortgage payment every month. So it's a very personal decision. If, if, if you can tame that blood monster or not, Benita knew there was no way that she was, she was going to be able to overcome it. There's another slide, though, to this dealing to it with, uh, dealing with uncertainty. And that is, uh, you need to sort of be able to uh, roll with the punches or think on your feet or deal with the unexpected. Uh, I forget if it was last summer or the summer before. I remember it was hot. Uh, I came downstairs to lead this webinar. It was literally this webinar. And uh, the internet was fine. I'm like, oh, I'll go reboot the router. Okay, long story short, the router was, was like fritzed out, busted, whatever. I didn't have time to go to Best Buy, get into what a fiddle the ball is. So I, I opened my cell phone and I'm like, free Wi-Fi near me. So I went to a neighborhood coffee shop. I led this workshop from outside on their patio. That's how I remember it was hot. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> and you know the show must go on people <laughs> so that's another thing about you know dealing with uncertainty so you, you, you've got to be able to not freak out when they expect it happens okay the third thing uh, just like i used to tell my daughter when she was a teenager just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should uh, you already heard me say it's the hardest job you'll ever have but a lot of consulting or even solopreneurship boils down to managing expectations being an exceptional listener and contracting effectively which of course means clarifying you know the work what are you going to be providing and by when and estimating the level of effort those are unusual skills skills that many of us have never uh, have never practiced and used very much. For people who have had prior consulting experience, they tend to have an easier time making the transition into self-employment because they're used to sort of doing that contracting and scoping and and most importantly saying no when they need to when they need to. So if you've contracted to do uh, A, B, C, and D and the client says, oh my gosh, Liz, you know, you're, you're so good at this. Is there any way that you can also do item, you know, this other thing, item E? You have to have the presence of mind to say, my gosh, I'd love to help you. I, I can see that you're in a bind. It's not in our current contract. Should we set up a you know, 30 minute meeting to talk about what that would take and what that would entail? Then you have the opportunity to do a change order and get paid for that extra thing. Right? But as particularly, I see it all the time with consultants, is, you know, we want to. We want to please our client. We want to make them happy, but then you end up overworking or giving stuff away. And so a lot of it, it's not just prior consulting experience. It's also a little bit about, um, uh, I hate the word mindfulness. You know, being knowing, being mindful of what you've committed to, what you're being asked of, and being able to sort of slow down your thoughts so you can, so you can pause and say. Mm. Yeah, we need to have another, we need to have a conversation about how I can do this. All right. Fourth thing to consider is your mental outlook. If you've just been laid off, it could be the best time to make the leap or it could be the worst time. It depends really on how on your on your mental outlook, period. And it, I'm this slide always reminds me of my brother. My brother, he was like I don't know, 56, 57 at the time that he got laid off. And of course, I was already a self-employed consultant. And he, I, and I, he says, oh, I'm, you know, I'm kind of thinking I could consult to the, to the industry that I just, you know, that I've been working in all these 45 years. He said, but who's going to hire a middle-aged white guy? And I said, well, nobody. It's that kind of an attitude. So it's all about how you approach it. Uh, confidence is the the thing that ties all of the success keys together when it comes to being, when it comes to being self-employed. The good news is now Pika exists in the Pika community. So um, when the FUD monster says, you know, who are you? And get you, you have imposter syndrome and all that sort of stuff. You have a place to go to say, okay, I, I need help with this or I'm, I'm, I'm feeling anxious this week or this month. Um, the other thing is, um, I forgot, just flew out of my head. But anyway, confidence is everything. So if you're um, if you're feeling a little bit you know a little bit hesitant, oh I know what it was. It's not just about outward confidence either. It's also knowing yourself and knowing that you're smart enough and resourceful enough to get the help you need, to find the answers you need. Because there's always going to be something that you haven't done before that you've got to figure out. You've got to learn how to do this or but you need to be able to trust yourself that you're smart enough to figure out what you don't know. So that's the other angle. All right, let's talk about uh, the big the big one, right? Getting new projects, finding work, developing a pipeline of leads, all of these sort of things. So this is definitely the biggest FUD that never entirely goes away. It's even larger than life itself when you're just starting out. So one way to get over this is uh, to, to get over the psychological hurdle of thinking of it as sale, because it's not sale. If you look at the definition of business development anywhere, you don't see the word sale. 
It's about building trusting relationships. So, you know, that's, if you keep, whenever the word sales comes up, just like nix it and replace it. I, I replace it with the word outreach, right? So I like doing outreach. It's basically connecting with other people, people I haven't talked to in a long time, uh, being of service, forwarding articles of interest to people, or just keeping in touch. Uh, so I, you know, I've been self-employed 20 years and I've never done any sales. And in my mind, I've never even done any business development. I do maintain a healthy network and maintain relationships and, uh, and thoughtful. So what I'm trying to say is don't make this fear large, larger than it, than it needs to be. Uh, particularly if you're thinking about going into coaching or independent consulting, most people in those fields tend to be problem solvers, not salespeople. And so the good news is you, you don't have to be a salesperson. But if you're interested in people and their success, odds are it's going to be a little bit easier for you. Liz? Mm -hmm. Hi, Liz. It's Paula. Um, sorry, you're kind of the, the volume just kind of came out just a couple of times. Can you repeat the, maybe the last two sentences? If you remember them. <laughs> if I remember them. Uh, yes. I, uh, most people that are in executive coaching or independent consulting tend to be problem solvers and interested in helping people solve, you know, solve a problem, make life easier, make life better, fix the situation. And so you don't need to be a salesperson. If you think with that hat, that perspective on, that hat on, that I'm here to help people, it's easier to find you projects because you're not selling. You're listening and trying to understand their projects. Right? So it's, it's, a, it's flipping it, sort of. Uh, <clears throat> one thing I do want to say about getting new projects is your ability to network and find uh, your ability to network and keep your network active or what I call it, keep your network warm, can make or break your success when you're self-employed. So I encourage you definitely to really reflect on this because uh, the most successful solopreneurs I know get their work through referrals. And that's all because they take care, they, the care and feeding of the people in their, in their network. But the other side of referrals, it's not just taking care of the people in your network and constantly expanding your network. The other part of that is uh, being known for something. That's how you also get referrals. You become the go-to person for X, Y, Z. Um, and I think that was to Jane's comment earlier about, you know, how do I really define my value? I said, gotta know what you gotta know what your niche is. So that's the other secret ingredient to getting to getting referrals. Any questions before I take a, a sip of tea? Um, I have a question. Um, I'll just easier for me verbally, but I think, you know, I'm probably not alone in that when I was working, I was working 11 and 12 hours a day and I didn't probably, you know, right. It's sort of like that thing you, you tend not to remember to reach out to people. Um, I feel like my network's pretty good, but I, but I am in that situation where sometimes people don't hear from me unless I need a favor. Um, and so, you know, I've made my own bed that I'm laying in, in, in a lot of ways, but even as a, a consultant, so let's say we do decide we consult, how do you, how do you balance your time and just make sure that it's sort of the important versus the urgent? Yes. Okay. So there's two, two ways I want to address this. Thank you for bringing this up, Valerie, because uh, particularly if you have been uh, as a full-time employee for the majority of your career or we have a couple of FICA members, one in particular who is a Hewlett Packard for her whole career, like 22 years. So all of her network was either still in Hewlett Packard or like retired. Um, there's always a lot of concern about reaching out to people that feeling like your network may be stale or that you haven't kept in, in touch with them. And two, two things about this. One is COVID time was weird. Right. In some ways, it felt like it was just two years ago when it really was four. So it was sometimes COVID time either felt like it was really long or it was really short. And everybody's time sense of timing got screwed up. So even though it might have been pre COVID since you reached out to somebody, it, it, it's not necessarily going to feel like, like that in reality. Right. Um, and the other thing is that other people 
haven't reached, kept in touch with you either, right? I'm sure if somebody reached out to you, Valerie, and said, you know, hey, it's been a while since we since we worked together on this that project five years ago. I can't believe it's just that long ago. COVID time was weird. Uh, would you like to get together and, and reconnect and have a virtual cup of tea or something? So they haven't reached out to you either. So it's kind of a two-way street. Um, so there's that. And the other thing that I really wanted to mention is when you're just stepping out on your own, or even before you step out on your own, meaning like right now, you guys are in sort of this golden opportunity zone of being able to reconnect with people in your network and saying, hey, you know, I'm reevaluating what I want to do with the next chapter of my career. And I really enjoyed partnering with you on that project, or I really value your perspective. Would you be interested in a, you know, 15 minute phone call? Uh, I'd love to pick your brain on, on just uh, what you remember of how, of how we work together. And then that's a great excuse to ask them how they are, whatever, and, and say, you know, well, I'm thinking about stepping out and to do, on my own to do ABC. What do you think of that idea? Is this something that, you know, you think people will hire an external person to do? Or do you think it's more of an internal resource job? Or when you think of me, what words come to mind? Or just, you know, there's a whole laundry list of questions. But it's a really terrific way to reconnect with your network. With your network. Now, you don't have to connect with all 500 people you're connected to on LinkedIn, but even five, right, will get the ball. And it'll help build that muscle and reconnect. Okay. Let's keep going. Supply and demand. So, um, okay, my cheesy comment here when I see this slide is don't just roll the dice and hope for the best, but you can actually sort of gauge what the market is for your skills, services, and or expertise, you know, what it is that you're going to offer to your clients. Uh, let me give you let me give you two two different examples. So first, let's say that you're really great at planning and facilitating senior leader offsites. You know these are usually their three day events, and you know sometimes they have a speaker or whatever. But this is this is your this is what you love to do. You know you do it really really well. So the good news is that most companies can't afford to have someone on staff that does this real well, or their ex existing staff often doesn't have the bandwidth. So that is, there is demand for that from clients because they often don't have the people internally. But let's take another example. Let's say you uh, want to get into executive coaching or life coaching or any type of career coaching. There's literally thousands of coaches in any given metropolitan area. So there's a glut of supply. So then your challenge is, well, how am I going to really stand out? I'm not saying it's not possible. Just saying it's going to take a little bit more work on your part, whether that's through your, your branding, your blogging, your speeching, your podcast, your speaking, your, speaking, your podcast, uh, whatever. Um, but that's that's sort of what I mean by su supply and demand. Unfortunately, there is no uh, magic way to, you know, tap a crystal ball and get the answer here. Uh, but you can reach out to some people, uh, either prior clients or people that you've worked with who might be in a position to hire you and say, hey, what's your sense for the market in this area, right? Do you think there's like way too many people that do this? Or, you know, back to our informational reconnecting interview phone calls that I talked about before. Uh, it's a little bit like licking your finger and sticking it in the wind to see which way it's blowing, but it's better than nothing. And I, here's another idea, which I haven't tried, but encourage you guys to try it. We recently had a members only round table. I think it was a webinar, I can't remember, on how to use chat GPT when you're self-employed. And uh, it's something that you could you could ask chat GPT. And now chat GPT is going to give you this answer like my database only goes up to the year 2021. So this information might not be correct or whatever the heck chat GPT says. So you know if you can phrase your prompt in a way that says you know, up to the year 2021 or whatever your date, you know, your information goes to, what was the sense of uh, how many consultants, people specialized in organizational development consulting in the San Francisco Bay Area? I don't, I don't, it's, it's worth a try. It's amazing what you can find out in chat GPT. <clears throat> Another idea is um, in addition to having 
phone calls with people in your network and saying, hey, you know, I'm kind of thinking about this idea. Uh, is you can send what I call a trial balloon email. So you don't necessarily have to take time to have conversation, live conversations with all these people, although that's better. <clears throat> but you can uh, send a, an email, something that says, like, hey, Sue, I really value your perspective. I'm thinking of starting my own consulting practice to do X, Y, Z. What do you think of this idea? Do you think I'm nuts? Do you think there's a market for this? Do you think there's already too many people that do this? You know, so you can send that to 10 people and see, see if they uh, reply. This has that sort of a tactic or the phone calls has a, uh, a compounded effect in that when people are involved in developing a solution, they're more, they're more likely to support its adoption and or when it to succeed. So what I mean by this is let's say Valerie reaches out to Paula and they have this conversation and Paula's like, yeah, I don't know. I think you should. Yeah, why not? Go for it. And so Valerie, you know, a week, month or two months later, you're like, okay, I took, you know, really thought about this. I'm going to go for it. I've launched my website. Paula is going to be your biggest cheerleader. Well, maybe not your biggest, but one of them, because she was involved in your decision process. So you're sort of fertilizing the soil so that when you do announce that you're going to be hanging out your shingle, uh, these people are in your corner and supporting you. All right, so here's uh, this slide used to say something else, but I uh, changed it last year after I had a participant in my solo consulting boot camp. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, what's the solo consulting boot camp? It's an eight week program that involves, I forget, five coaching sessions and six workshops, or I don't know. It's like, it, it's a boot camp, okay. And so this one person, like he had, 25 years of experience with high-tech companies, I forget. But he um, he struggled, even with the structure of the boot camp, uh, because he missed his his routine of the court, you know, of his meeting with his his team once a week or his having his, you know, what are those things called? They're not key performance indicators, but they're objectives and key objectives set quarterly or whatever, uh, or planning for the the quarterly business review or he he liked that rhythm. But more more to the point of this particular person is he suffered from shiny object syndrome. He had trouble focusing on what the homework was. So let's say one week the homework is well, the cohort is every other every other friend. And so one of the homework in the that period was okay, do a draft of your of your website. So then we come back together as a cohort. We look at all of our stuff, right? And we offer feedback and we make suggestions. And, and time and again, he wouldn't have done it. He didn't do his homework. And like on this website one, he says, he says, well, I also have a, a you know, a, a, a business on the side where I invest in commercial properties and I built a website for that. I'm like, David, <laughs> that's not going to help you get your business off the ground. <laughs> so anyway. He was not a self-starter and he liked to put things off and do what he wanted to do, not what necessarily was required. <laughs> when you're just starting out, you don't really have that luxury. So try to think about, you know, these are all personal decisions. This is why I encourage you to take notes and share these notes and these questions with somebody close to you, whether it's a partner or your best friend or your adult kid or something, because they can help hold the mirror up and say, well, no, I don't know, mom. Like, you get really crabby if you have to work more than eight hours a day, whatever. All right, so let's talk about the um, the, the big one. And uh, I know was, uh, one of you guys mentioned it in your, your fear, uncertainty, and doubt, your FUD, your FUDs, this health insurance thing. So with, uh, you know, with, I uh, have, but the health exchanges now, it's definitely less of an obstacle than it used to be. When I fell into independent consulting in 2004, getting insurance as a, as a solo person or without being part of a company plan is definitely easier, but it's still expensive. <laughs> There's just no way around that. Uh, it seems like it's more expensive than ever before. 
obviously, if you have a spouse or domestic partner with company-sponsored health insurance, uh, this is less of a consideration uh, than if you don't. Um, so let's talk about the situation where you don't have that person you can rely on. Uh, if you can go COBRA, do that. So if you've been laid off and you have the option to you know, extend your health benefits from your prior employer, 90% of the time, in fact, in all of my years, 20 years, self-employed, I've only ever heard of once somebody getting a better deal that, other than their COBRA. Uh, so you can save yourself kind of a lot of research and just go COBRA. It is going to cost you a lot more because you're going to have to pay the employer's share of their premium. But the reason why it's still less expensive is because it's a group plan. And group plans are always less expensive. So ride that COBRA train as long as you can. But then eventually, of course, it's going to run out. So my uh, second piece of advice is contact a health insurance broker in your state. They don't cost you anything, and they'll give you very good advice. Uh, they're paid by the insurance agent, the insurance companies. So when my, so when I fell into independent consulting in 2004, I'd been laid off. I extended COBRA. So like in 2005, or whenever it was, I had to buy my own insurance. Uh, also that same year, I uh, got divorced. Okay, so here I am, single mom, and I need to pay. I need insurance for me and my kid. So I talked to, I called a broker, and I said, uh, I need a, I need a family plan. I, it's COBRA's ending. He says, well, how many people are in your family? I said, well, it's me and my daughter. He says, so there's just two of you? He said, yes. He said, well, then you definitely don't want a family plan because a family plan seems four people or more. He says, what well, you're going to want are two separate independent plans, one for you, one for your daughter. Uh, and if you're both healthy, take a high deductible plan. Uh, and this is, this is the way to go. So my daughter, who was uh, four years old at the time, great health. Got her a plan, high deductible, was fifty dollars a month. Okay, when so she just went to college. She, you know, so five years ago she went to college, or whatever, and um, it, it had only gone up to like a hundred or two hundred dollars a month. It was still very affordable for her to have her own plan. I never would have had that idea if it wasn't for the health for the health broker. When I moved to a new state, when I left San Francisco and to Reno about four years ago. Needed new health insurance because Blue Cross doesn't doesn't work over here. Whatever that bank is shielded. So I called a health broker. Okay, great, no problem. Well, I told her I wanted a a high deductible plan that was HSA compatible. So a health savings account. This is another way that you can save money and build wealth over time. It's because you can sock away. Depends if you're an individual or a family. Anywhere from I'm going to get these numbers wrong. Four thousand to eight thousand dollars a year into this tax deferred plan, you get to invest it year over year over year and let it grow tax deferred. Uh, which reminds me that some estimates say, I think it's Fidelity Investments that does this every single year. They do a study and they say that uh, the average couple in retirement will spend $200,000 in out-of-pocket expenses post-retirement, 200K. And that's with Medicare, Part D, C, supplements, whatever the heck all that stuff is. Um, so another reason to have an HSA plan and start funneling money away and invest it. Oh, but anyway, back to the health insurance uh, broker. So, uh, you know, the next year, my plan, they sent me this big packet to renew whatever. I'm like, whatever, fine, I just renew it. Well, then she called me a few weeks later. She's like, Liz, did you renew that plan, the renewal? And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, no, they discontinued the, the HSA compatible part. And I know that's really important to you. So we need to get you a different plan. I would have been completely clueless. So, yes, find yourself a good broker. Um, so, my last piece of advice about uh, health insurance is it's it's still going to be expensive <laughs> with through a broker or whatever. And so, the, the p other piece of the puzzle that slides in there is you have to charge enough that you can afford it. That's another reason why independent consulting coaches and all these self-employed people tend to charge a lot because they're running their own business and they have to pay for their own health insurance. So that goes back to the you know pricing and billing rate strategy. The other thing though that nobody tells you about in this um, might want to talk you out of being self-employed is paid vacations are twice or paid time off. There's no such thing. Your vacations are twice as expensive because you're not earning money because you're not billing. 
billing clients or whatever, you're not doing any work, but you're also spending the money to go on the vacation. So there's the opportunity cost that goes with the actual cash outlet of the, of the vacation. So uh, that actually, even though I knew it when I was self-employed, I didn't care because that's why I worked so hard is to take fabulous vacations. And I was always the type of person that maxed out my vacation time at the company anyway. And I'm like, fine, I'll just take it without pay time off or go without pay. Without pay. But yes, they are poison. Uh, Liz, question. Um, I know there's different webinars I'm signed up for for some of these individual topics, but at a high level, are benefits something that you can write off a taxable yeah. deduction? Okay. Or... Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Your premiums. As, yeah. You can write off. Uh, and then Jade put something in the chat. What if, what about insurance for your business? How do you know what coverage you need? Yes, that's another whole another whole animal, and you probably do need it. Well, you should have whether or not you need it because we live in a very litigious society. So at a minimum, you should carry general business insurance, general liability insurance. Um, so, and it also depends on who your clients are. If you're going to work with major corporations, they're going to require you to have at least two kinds of insurance, general liability insurance, errors and emissions insurance. I once handled a contract to my other company, Proco, in their master services agreement as for nine different types of insurance. My first job out of college was selling insurance, so I'm smarter than the average bear when it comes to this stuff, and I had never heard of some insurance. I'm like, what the hell? Turns out we had the insurance. It was just embedded in one of our other policies, but they make it as difficult as possible. I mean, really, don't get me started on this. W2 versus 1099 thing. But uh, Jane, to answer your question more succinctly, there is a uh, a, set, a whole page on PICA's website that explains what the different types of insurance are, what types are most common. Uh, so if you go to PICA's website, which is PICAnetwork.org, in the top menu bar says resources, there's a section called being a business. You'll find the information on business insurance there. It's another reason why you have to charge good rates. You need to pay for that too. Oh, that reminds me. Actually, before I go here, that reminds me. Somebody said something um, earlier about how to keep my um, so my network is kind of a little bit stale. But how do I continue to not become that? How do I not become that person again that only calls when they need you need something? And um, the rule of thumb there is to spend twenty percent of your time one day a week eight hours a week if you're working 40 hours on um, working on your business, not in it. That means doing outreach, working on your accounting, your billing, your marketing, your public PR, whatever it is. Uh, but 20% of your time should be spent doing that. All right. So, oh boy, I'm running up to two, two slides. So I got to talk faster. So uh, work ethic, this is my favorite Dilbert cartoon. Totally reminds me of when I worked back to one of the big, big four, four firms. Um, so it's true that when you're self-employed, your working hours are flexible, but the hours can also be erratic and demanding. Uh, you're often a slave to the client's timeline or deadline, and you need to be able to keep your work. So it goes back to sort of being mindful and not over-promising. Um, but the best consultants, meaning the ones, the best solopreneurs, even the ones who get referrals and repeat business, do whatever it takes to get the job done. So if they've committed, I'll get it to you by the end of day. This used to happen. I'll get it to you by the end of the day. That's at four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. And then I pick up my kid and she's not feeling well, or she fell. We have to go to the emergency room. You know, life happens. So uh, there were many times that I was getting something to people by 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning because I didn't learn to under promise. Uh, so anyway, you need to be a person who keeps sober. And the last thing to consider before we jump into the other section is uh, it's worth thinking about your intrinsic motivation and what inspires you. Uh, so if any of the questions on this slide are true for you, a traditional job may be more fulfilling. So particularly um, not being part of it, not being part of a team, I always just embedded myself on the team and then kept in touch with the people afterwards. So that was never an issue for me. But if you do like mentoring others, or particularly seeing how your results play out over time, as an independent consultant in particular, you, you're not you're not around for that. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna shift gears 
uh, are there any questions on the things to consider? There's lots to think about and discuss with somebody you don't trust. Uh, will I provide information on boot camp at the end? Yes, I will. Remind me. But what I, I'll probably remember. All right, so let's talk about if there's a wait if you can test the waters before fully committing to your website, your branding, your LC, and all that other nonsense. And the answer is yes, there is subcontracting. Uh, when you're just starting out, I'm a big fan of subcontracting because you literally just have to do the, the real work. You don't have to find the, find the client, do the contract, carry the insurance, figure out the rate. You don't really don't have to do anything but the work. So it's a real easy, easy lift uh, to, to even see if you like this, this type of, of work. If you like consulting or being self-employed. Uh, the biggest downside, of course, is you're going to get it paid a fraction of what you're worth. Uh, agency fees are usually about 35%. I know of one agency that charges up to 50%, which I think is high robbery. So basically, if they're paying you $150 an hour, they're billing the client $300 an hour. You have to run the numbers. The type of work I did, which was easily going to be nine months or longer full-time work. In fact, I did run the numbers. Uh, that first year after I was was uh, fell into independent consulting and that project ended, I was caught flat-footed. Holy shoot, holy, well, you know, I got to pay the bills. So I went and interviewed with some agencies and I found out that their markup was 35%, they kept 35%. Well, I ran the numbers and I realized that on a typical project, let's say nine months, they were going to make $45,000. I'm like, that, not, uh, no way. <laughs> All they're doing is introducing me to the client. I'm like, I'm doing the diagnosis. I'm doing the plan. I'm putting together the strategy. I'm implementing. I'm boots on the ground. I'm not having a relationship with the client. I am not getting at $45,000. And I just doubled down on my hours and I said, uh-uh, I'm not my hours. Now, if you tend to do shorter things, like two weeks at a time or executive coaching, yeah, then maybe subcontracting might make more sense. But run the numbers before before you commit to something like this. And I'm not going to get into W2 versus 10 into 9, uh, but there's the way to, to build wealth over time is to build directly and get paid on 1099 basis. That's why we trademark the phrase friends don't make friends W2. Here are some uh, national agencies to consider. You're going to get these slides, and these are all hyperlinked to their website so you can investigate. They all have different flavors and pros and cons, or maybe one mark is more into marketing, one's more into finance or whatever. So they all have different nuances. And there's actually a slide in the appendix with questions to consider, questions to ask when you're evaluating an agency uh, to help think through which of these might be the best fit. Uh, I do hear very good things about BTG. And I know people that did dumb work through RGP too, although RGP tends to be a little bit more tactical and not pay quite as well. Uh, similar to agencies or online platforms, right? Keyword driven, algorithms, et cetera. All of these names here are hyperlinked to their websites. Uh, it doesn't cost anything to submit your resume. On the other hand, there's a whole ton of competition out there. Catalan, I think, has like over 100,000 resumes on the database there. So if you upload a resume to one of these, or one or two, you um, put a long version of your resume in. So let's take, take this person who was a project manager at Hewlett Packard for 22 years. I said, okay, build, list every project you ever led at Hewlett Packard and write, you know, the date, maybe, maybe that project named it, maybe it didn't, or what was your role? Well, lo and behold, the resume was three pages long and she had the word project manager on there like 16 times. That's how you do, you play this algorithm. Okay. Okay, four minutes, I can do it. So, somebody already put in a question. Uh, we provide information to bootcamp at the end. If you're sure you really want to do this, you can still self-contract while you're doing everything it takes to get things set up, right, for your own for your own business. Um, of course, if you were laid off and you have severance, you might have to self-contract. But here are the next steps that I recommend. First of all, absolutely, 100%. Discuss these trade-offs with somebody you know and trust you who's going to have to put up with your fear, uncertainty, doubt, and complaining um, because you're going to need a, a, some, a champion in your corner. 
uh, if I was in your shoes, the next thing I would do is try Pika for forty nine dollars. It's literally it's forty nine bucks, uh, and with inflation, I'm looking at that. I'm like, maybe we should make it more expensive. But anyway, we just recently launched. I used to lead this uh, workshop workshop live, but we realized that not everybody can commit to a certain time or day doing it live, whatever. So now it's an asynchronous on demand course, and you can work through it at your own pace. I think there's seven modules, and there's homework. You know, it says pause the video, go do this, come back to it, et cetera. Um, and you can do that as a, a non PICA member for 49 bucks. No, it's not $49 a month. It's $49 for life, right? You Let's say you start it now, and then you take a full time job, you come back next year, and you're like, okay, now I hate that was a bad idea. I should have done that full time job. You can pick up still so one time fee, 49 bucks. That's what it sounds like. It's probably too cheap. Okay, so that's what I would do. Um, if you don't want to wait for these slides to, to reach you tomorrow, the um, the way to find it is to go to pikanetwork.org slash A-L-L. All stands for Asynchronous Learning Lab, and that's how you find it. So let's say you do that course, and then you're like, okay, now I really need to do that branding workshop or that billing rates workshop or that workshop on uh, business development. I should just join Pika. Pika membership is uh, $495 you will get a discount code that credits the $49 towards membership. So, you know, there's that. Um, or you could just join Pika and then you get the getting started a solar neural workshop included. So either way. Okay. Uh, what membership gives you is access to everything, tools, templates, all these things. There's two courses in the Asynchronous Learning Lab and um, office. Access, access to me, office hours, I hold them every week unless I'm on vacation, et cetera, our private community, all that stuff. But somebody asked me about the boot camp. Um, the boot camp, I'm in the middle of running one now, which is why there isn't a session available to sign up for. Uh, and we're looking to schedule the next one to start on April 5. Um, so you are already, by signing up for this webinar, you're already on Pika's mailing list. So you'll get notified when, when we release the dates for that. But um, it would start on April 5 and run every other Friday for eight eight weeks or 10 weeks. I forget, whatever. There's five every other Friday sessions. And then the workshops and everything are interspersed in between. Uh, the boot camp is more expensive, though. That is not included with uh, the membership because of the five cohort coaching sessions. Okay, so I did it right to the minute. But I am happy to uh, stay afterwards. We'll stop the recording. You guys can ask me any questions you have about being self-employed or really anything. I don't care. So <laughs> I love talking shop, uh, which is why I love holding office hours and staying late after these workshops and webinars. So let me stop the recording. And thank you. You'll get these notes and slides and everything by end of day tomorrow.